The problem that's happened both in poor white communities and poor black communities is those communities were normally formed during the industrial age, mm -hmm. right? When you have manufacturing and industry, you don't need as much of an education to, to enter the middle class, mm -hmm. okay? So during the great migration, blacks moved north and west and every single area where we see poverty clusters, it's as a result of blacks moving from the south to the north and west for jobs. 90% of blacks lived in the south during the civil war, after the civil war. 47% were in the north by 1968, okay? Mm -hmm. When we look at poor white communities, they usually are clustered around failed industry, right. coal, steel, yeah. et cetera, okay? So it was never a case that the education went wrong. The issue was that the education never existed. The average education of a black person migrating north was 6.9 years of schooling, right? This happened during segregation. And so what you ended up with, you had a lot of Blacks moving north. They were clustered into tight communities and they were uneducated. And that was, so between, the, between all the, the wars, the great wars, there was no immigration because the American government didn't want soldiers to have to come back and compete with foreigners for jobs. Get a million angry, angry soldiers, that could be a problem. Yeah. So what they did, they shut down immigration um, and that caused triggered another problem after World War II. About fifty, about five million blacks moved north and west for jobs because the soldiers came home, the women went home, right? And there was no immigration to fill the labor gap. Northern companies were recruiting to the south to grab people and bring them north. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you ended up with these clusters, and then the borders opened up manufacturing started to move overseas and you were left with an uneducated population where the jobs moved away yeah now normally what happens is the jobs go away and the people migrate someplace else but we also implemented generous social programs so you paid people to stay in places where there were no jobs yeah we created these so you have a situation where the jobs have left and then the government introduce generous programs. And we literally pay people to stay in areas where there's no hope of those jobs returning. And that's the same in Appalachia. I talked to a woman from West Virginia. Her family still lives there. The coal mines have collapsed. They, most of the community lives off of government assistance. Whereas mm -hmm. if we went back a hundred years ago, there's a reason why we have a thing called ghost towns. Yeah. When the economies collapsed, people got up and moved to areas to where there were jobs. Yeah. The way our government system works, we don't do that anymore. So we create these permanent poverty enclaves of the least educated Americans who need manufacturing and skilled labor jobs. They're never gonna go to college, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, and don't want to. So we're creating these problems, we're maintaining these problems. This would not have happened without that. Um, so, because these areas have hist their historical reasons, um, how they got there, right? If we look at undereducation, if we look at either racial segregation, and, re and, and segregation work both ways. Yeah. There's a reason why there's a concentration of white people in the Appalachia, that there was a level of segregation there, self-segregation, self-selected mm -hmm. segregation, but it's white, it, it was all white community, um, focused on coal mining. But if you look at Baltimore, it's, you know, that was done during segregation, but the net result is the same. And the key thing is, is that it's not systemic racism. Yeah. We, we took the racism out of the system in the 1960s, okay? Mm -hmm. We did that in the 1960s. So, and, and, and I have some quick numbers if I could, that, that, that it'll, it'll prove that racism has nothing to do with it, sure. beyond a shadow of a doubt, okay? So let's look at the black poverty rate in 1959. The black poverty rate in 1959 was 55%. The white poverty rate was 18.1%. So, you know, quite a bit yeah. of disparity. In 1968, yeah. when the Fair Housing Act was passed, black poverty went from 55% to 34.7%. White poverty went to 10% in 1968. Here's a shocker. In 2018, 
black poverty was 20.7%. So if we look at that, it goes from 55%. And over the course of 50 years, it falls to less than half. Yeah. White poverty in 2018 was, was at 11.8%. So after 50 years, the middle part of that white poverty leveled off to being about 10%, and in 2018 went up. Mm -hmm. So if we looked at it on the chart, you see white poverty looks like this, and black in every other racial group is high poverty and every other group is getting better. Mm -hmm. If a system was systemically stacked against minorities and people of color, you wouldn't see that. Yeah. Right. If you can't say that white America is built to benefit what um, that America is built built to benefit white people because white people aren't increasing in benefit, they're they're leveling off, and it kind of makes sense if you look at the ten the ten percent the lowest and ten percent the highest, it's a natural kind of a bell curve. Mm -hmm. So the American system is improving life for everyone, just at a different pace. Blacks a minority started at a lower point. It's taking time to level off, but you went from 55% poverty to 20% poverty, and you're mm -hmm. less than twice the poverty rate of white Americans, but, but that wasn't the case 50 years ago. They, yeah, this yeah. is from the US census data. This is not my data. You can go yeah, to the yeah. website, you can download the spreadsheets, and, and you will see that there is no systemic racism. Wow.